these are both two beautiful films. Um, and I have, I have a, a few questions for each of you, and then we'll turn it over to you guys. And they're, they're almost all the same ones. But um, um, I'm going to start with you, Karen, because you actually adapted this story. And I just want to ask you about the challenges of adapting a short story to the screen. What was that like for you? What did you have to, what were the, what did you have to deal with the most? Well, I, th I think that I, I was so in love with the story that in the beginning, I mean, for the, maybe the first year that we were working on it, I was very reluctant to change anything about the story. And I stayed very, very close. It was literally, I felt like I took the story and I just, took it from a short story form and I moved it into a screenplay form without making very many changes in it. But the more that I stayed with it, the more I began to think of it in terms of images and the more I started to feel, just little by little, that I could give myself permission to explore what might make it more filmic than what was on the page, which I think is always a challenge when you work with, with a, a piece of writing, particularly if you're as enamored of it as I was. So, um, you know, I began to just th think through how, you know, how the characters were introduced. And so I, I added some things to the story itself in terms of the introduction of, of the character of the young boy. Um, in the story, we don't meet him until he literally walks into the cafe. And I decided that it would be interesting to meet him just a few minutes before when he's like on his bike, on, the, uh, on his paper route. And, and I just added some little things and I even got as bold as to cut some, some things that I thought really um, didn't need to be there. Uh, some, some of the dialogue, but very little. Um, but I, I found that the big challenge, was just kind of uh, finding a way to find that little bridge between the, the written story and the film, the story we wanted to film. I, I, I was wondering, reading the story again today, um, if you were going to, which you didn't, if you would try to dramatize any of the story that the man is telling about the woman. Did that ever... Co it did occur to me, and, and I, I thought about it a lot, actually, that we would maybe, you know, cut away to what he's describing, or that, that, that the woman herself would become a character in the piece. And um, I think somewhere in the middle, you know, as we were, you know, approaching getting ready to do the film, I gave it a lot of thought, and in the end, I just decided that to keep it very simple, was was better. I think if I, you know, if we had decided to expand beyond the 29 minutes that this is, I would have liked to have met the man on the road and brought the man into the cafe and and you know kind of figured out where he was coming from and maybe something about his relationship to Leo, just little moments or whatever. I mean, I had a lot of thoughts of other things that we could do, but. At the same time, I re we felt very strongly that we needed to keep it under a half an hour. Um, and so, you know, it was really a matter of kind of continuing to spare, you know, to keep it spare. Um, Christy, who did the adaptation of, the, of yours, The Domestic Dilemma? Uh, his name is Robert. Robert Breslow. And did you, were you collaborating with him as he was doing it, or did you have input? What was your, uh, let, just talk about, because obviously as the director you would have read the story, even if the script came to you already done, to, to e examine the differences between them. Can you just talk about that? A uh, bit? Actually it was, uh, you know, I, I almost didn't, I was unaware of what I, as a director, could conceivably do with the material uh, because I was in such awe of the story. The only thing I felt I needed to do was to establish him in some way 
before he goes home, which isn't as well brought out in the story. And I wanted to give a little bit more detail about the fact that he had to leave and get home uh, before a certain hour, and that he and his secretary were sort of in cahoots. Um, and that whole sort of opening sequence is not in the story. And as I was watching it tonight, I thought, wow. <laughs> you know, this is a period film with cars and God, costumes and the Amazing. whole nine yards. And how did I dare do that? <laughs> it was sort of like, yikes. You know, I was like, OK, you know. Yeah, that was incredible that you well, had, you didn't know what you couldn't do, so I, that's always right, a good thing. I didn't know what I couldn't do. <laughs> there so you, you go. were able to do it. There you go. I, didn't I mean, that's know what a I huge thing do. to pull off that cityscape with all those period yeah, cars. Yeah, those cars, and, the bus but climbing on That actually George leads me to the next question, <laughs> which, but, but first I just want to make a little comment, which is that you both gave backstory to the characters, which is a really, um, interesting and important part of adapting page to the screen is there are things you can write and uh, you know in the paper uh, on paper and tell you know describe in words that then you have to put into images so sometimes you need to really invent whole new scenes that 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 do what the words are doing but they do them in a visual way that that can set up the characters and expand them because you can't hear what's going on inside their heads but um, I, I actually want to ask both of you how, for you being a production designer, informed your filmmaking as a director, because I think that the fact that you, I mean, you were, the, the attention to detail and visual in the, their environment was so profound and fantastic and contributes so much to the story. And then after you answer that, I'm going to ask you how being an actor, because it was so much about performance contributed to your work as a director? Oh, you, how okay. being a production designer um, Well, again, you. it just felt, well, it was a period piece. And I think one of the interesting things about the, the whole notion of what was going on at that time was, yes, moms were at home, um, and, and dads were at work, and drinking was not something that anyone did much about other than to kind of put up with it in some form. And so the philosophy behind the storytelling, it was important for me that we make it very clearly in a period, the period that it was. Um, and, and the attention to detail was sort of automatic and necessary. Um, but yes, because I have the other side of my experience is a visual storytelling, I wanted to give an essence of a, like almost a perfect household in that period. And that, you know, the house was perfect, the street was perfect, the, you know, it was a, a very, very uh, comfortable existence, and yet inside was this, um, this terrible truth that you know, that the tooth fairy, which I was thinking about you too, because <laughs> Suzanne has done a wonderful film about teeth, House of Teeth it's well, called. It's about teeth, but no, but I mean it was teeth. <laughs> but the fact that here is this truth that's inside that it, that's growing and it's going to kind of take over this the family, the life of this family and how to deal with it. But that was all sort of metaphor, but what I wanted to very much do and Leslie Pope, who was the production designer uh, I had worked with before as a set decorator, and so she's extremely talented in that area. So it, it was like the quintessential uh, 50s home. And it was important that it be that. So we, we grabbed as much as we could, wallpaper, all the, all the fittings, to make sure that it had all of that going on in it. Well, it gives a, such a vivid sense of character, too. I mean, it's really a great example of, of, of environment as character and of the importance of those details in film. It just sort of even subliminally tells you so much about the characters, the world they live in, which was so clearly defined. Yeah. So as an actor... Well, I, I just one thing I'd love to say is that is that 
Carson McCullough's writing is filled with detail. So it, it really lends you, I mean, it lends itself to that kind of, of work. Um, you know, both in both of these stories, and, and I've, I've read just again recently, Domestic Dilemma, I mean, it's filled with all those wonderful little details. I mean, she describes the Christmas lights that the, that the girl is playing with, and, and um, you know, in, in A Tree, A Rock, A Cloud, there's just enormous texture and detail in the way that she writes the story. So you're kind of, you know, it, it, you're given all of this wonderful material, and then you're trying to find you know, the, the way to bring it to life. You bring it to life off the page. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, I've, I've found that, you know, over the many, many years that I've worked as, a, with, as an actor, there have been directors I have worked with who have been so extraordinary um, for me to, to work with. And, and then there are directors who really don't know how to work with actors at all. And, and so as an actor, you, you, you know, you learn to be like very, very prepared to do the work on your own on the chance that you're gonna find yourself with a director who really ha doesn't have any interest in, in really helping guide an actor or help develop a character with an actor. They, they really do expect you to show up with with you know every little detail of what of what you're doing, um, and I've just discovered you know as I began to direct in the theater that I I have an absolute love of working with actors and and um, have been very much inspired by directors that I've worked with who I felt were very gifted in that direction, and so you know f for me. You, you know, a, a lot of, I always feel like the, um, you know, one of the, the real uh, strengths of a director is in their choice of actors. So uh, at, at, when I direct in the theater, I always feel like the success of what I'm doing is very much based on the casting of the play. And, and if I cast the play right, then, you know, my job is 80% done. And I think the same is very much true in film. And, and Jeff DeMunn, who I've known for many years, who is one of the most extraordinary actors I've ever seen on stage, uh, I particularly have, have you know, watched and loved his work uh, in the theater, but he's also extraordinary in film and, and in television. Um, and James McMenamin, who plays Leo, the guy behind the bar who I've worked with uh, a couple times I've directed him in, in plays. Um, I just knew that they would be, you know, just live in these, live in the shoes of these characters. And, um, you know, and then there's Jackson, who, who after meeting, we, we, we put out a casting call for actors and I think we got something like 250 responses. And we went through them and we, we kind of came down to about 50 or 60 young actors who we met. And then we had screen tests for about 11 of those actors. And Jackson was away when we did the screen test, but I had met him and I just had this feeling about him. I just thought, you know, we have, to, we have to do a screen test when Jackson comes back. So Jeff DeMunn came. I, I said, you know, I just, there's this one young man. I just have this feeling about him. And Jeff came all the way back to do a screen test with Jackson. And Jeff sat down, and about 10 seconds into the screen test, he said he just had this complete and total feeling as I had had, that this was really the actor that, that we should be, uh, the boy that we should work with. And he, he, uh, he was just incredible to work with. You were. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think it gives really a beautiful performance in the film. And, um, you know, I, I feel very, you know, blessed with wonderful actors and, and I, you know, 
it, it is a great thing to, to have all that background as an actor when you start to then direct because, you, you know, we speak the same language. Mm, right. Yeah. Um, so, Nick, you uh, presumably live and breathe Carson McCullers. And, um, I do. <laughs> and I assume you know both, fact, the, yes. both these stories very well. And they're very different films. Um, and I, I'm, I'm just curious how, you know, I mean, we all, when we read things, we visualize them, and I, I'm curious how these films sort of square with your, what was in your imagination, and, and or what they make you think or see about Carson McCullers that maybe you hadn't even thought of before. Well, you know, one of the things is that uh, before I came to Nyack, which I started coming last year, really. I didn't understand a domestic dilemma the way I do now. Um, as far as I know, this is the only McCullough story set in Nyack, and I feel like it's set in Nyack. May as well be Nyack. Could be Grandview, I suppose, right? But um, and excuse me, where did you shoot that? I mean, I know you shot coming across the Tabin Sea Bridge, but we were, we were in New Jersey. Oh, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Oh well. But, but in our minds, we were in Nyack. Uh, I, I was saying to the library group earlier this week, uh, we met on a Thursday, and the story is set on a Thursday. Right. And it's set almost exactly this time of year because there's scraps of snow. Must have been before daylight savings time because it got dark by the time we got on the bus. But I thought you captured that beautifully. I love the whole scene with the bus and going across the bridge and all of that. And before I started doing that myself, uh, I, I, I didn't quite, uh, um, I wasn't able to picture the story the way that I am now. And I think that the film uh, captures that uh, beautifully. Um, and I don't know, some, there's, there's something about that that is special to me, that it's a Nyack story, that it's her Nyack story in a way. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm like Karen in that I read all of McCullers when I was in my 20s. I sort of found her and then read it all at one time. And, um, you know, of course, she's mostly known for the novels, but I felt that A Tree of Rocket Cloud is, it was my favorite story. And um, I think that in both of the films that they are able to convey something about what the stories um, are about thematically, the essential theme, right? And for McCullers, uh, love is one of the big th themes. And of course, in Trio Rocket Cloud, it has that set piece sort of where he, his definition, his science of love. But really, also a domestic dilemma. It's the same thing. It comes around to this business about love. That's why he embraces her uh, in the end of the story and in the, in the end of the film. And so um, I love the way that b both of the films, in their own way, bring that out. I mean, in Karen's film, he, we, we have him saying it, but also the music, the image of the trees at the end, all of that, the, the boy's face, everything about it is conveying it. And in Christie's film, um, the way that Ray Liotta uh, interacts with the children, for instance, and then also that last scene, you know, I think they are driving home sort of um, the, the real thematic depth of the stories um, which is about love, so. Um, the, my last question is about pacing. Um, I mean, 25 years ago, it wasn't quite as bold as it is now to pace a film so kind of slowly and thoughtfully. I love that. I'm partial to that kind of pacing, and, and particularly because it, I mean, if it serves the story you're telling, which in this case, in both cases, it does. Um, but um, particularly, I mean, they're both beautifully, they both take the time they need to tell the story. And um, I wonder, uh, Christy, if that was an issue for you at all when, when you were making it, and I'm going to guess that for you it was, and that, so I'm going to ask you to answer first, but then I want you to talk about taking the liberty of pacing it the way you did and really taking your time and also the choice to allow it to be in black and white. So first, Christy, let's talk about pacing. 
I think that there was definitely, well, the intent was that this was part of a three, three directors uh, did uh, adaptations. Uh, this was part of a series called Women and Men. One, there was a Women and Men 1, I guess, and there was a Women and Men 2 that HBO uh, put out. And so this was part of the second one. And so we, we were, it was uh, important for us to keep within a certain uh, number of minutes so that it could stay as a broadcastable thing. But what I was aware of just in terms of the storytelling was that it almost paced itself in a strange sort of way. I mean, um, when he comes home, there's this, and he picks up the glove, and suddenly there's this kind of, you know, he's, he's sort of rhapsodizing about, uh, you know, my child, da da da. And then he hears this scream, and bang, he's in the house, and then he's seeing what's going on. And from that point on, um, you have to have the pauses because to just settle in to the fact that here are these little kids downstairs in the house playing with electricity, you know, it's Christmas tree lights all over the place. Where's mom? You know, um, mom is not there. And, and so you have to keep all of that kind of, the, the, there was almost a threat in how long they were by themselves. And, and then when he's trying to, to figure out what's going on with dinner and he goes in and he tries to, you know, he doesn't want to rush anything because he can't, you know, it's going to make the kids even more nervous and he's trying to tamp down something. Um, and, and so there's, and then upstairs too, I mean, she's relaxing. It, it, there was no, it didn't feel like you could go any faster. And I'm not sure as a story it would work if you went any faster with, or if you cut it differently. You just wanted to be an observer uh, in this scene and try not to take any sides um, and just be there watching this all unfold. And so to do that, it just takes time. <laughs> so that's why, that's why it was the way it was, yeah. I, I think, you know, our, the, I always had a sense of this film having this kind of breath about it. It was sort of like, uh, I, I think it's very, the film is, is the, the essence of it is really about being in the moment, learning to be in the moment. And I mean, it, 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 I always felt like the, at the core of the film is about how, in a way, we've, we, we have all been taught that love is outside of us somewhere and that, you know, we, we yearn for this love that's outside and, and then, of course, we, we lose it. You know, it, it, if it's outside of us, it can be taken away from us. And, and that, in essence, the story is about him discovering that love is really inside of himself and that it's a skill that emanates out as opposed to something that we grab for outside and try to possess, you know. And that in that possession is suffering and that he's had to really go through these incredible struggles. And there was something in the core of, of him talking about his meditation. I wanted to find something. I wanted to find a rhythm that felt right for the telling of that story. And, and I felt like it was in the story, the way that she wrote the story. I think when, you know, it, it felt bold and we struggled with it. I mean, it's, there's seven minutes of silence. In the, the first seven minutes of the film are silent. No one speaks. And, and I know we, we, we talked about it a lot. Can you make a film like that now? Can, like, can you do a film where no one speaks and not much happens for seven minutes? Uh, can, you, can you hold an audience's attention in this world of car crashes and things, cuts, you know, where it's just like cut, 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 you know. Um, all the, you know, handheld cameras moving all over the place. And we just decided, I think, to go in that direction. Um, 
I don't know how many of you may have seen, there's a beautiful film that won uh, Best Foreign Film in the Academy Awards two years ago uh, called Ida or Ida, a Polish film that was shot in black and white. And, and I loved the storytelling. I think I, I watched the film five or six times. And what fascinated me about it, without me even knowing it, is that he, he, he never moves the camera. The camera in that film never moves until the very last shot of the film. And I, I knew there was something profound that was happening that was helping me become close to the characters in a way that I felt I hadn't in a film in a very long time. And then I, I found an interview with him, with the director, whose name I think is Paul Pawlowski or something. Um, and, and he talked about making a decision to not move the camera, um, which I think is called locked, uh, locked in shots or locked, what? Locked off shots. And I, I talked to the cinematographer and I said, you know, I love this style. I love what he's done for a piece where you really want to make a connection with the characters. And so we talked about doing it that way and decided to do that. And um, it just became a part of the storytelling that actually just allowed, I feel, like a connection with the characters more so than, than I normally feel on the screen. And, and I think we felt the black and white really set it into the time period beautifully. Um, and we knew we didn't have a lot. We didn't have a lot of resources making the film to set it into a time period. Um, you know, we were struggling, struggling. Christy did an extraordinary job pretty, doing the production design yeah. on a on a little wing and a prayer of a budget. And um, so, <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, but we felt that the black and white would really um, allow us to, to you know, be in this period. And, and we also talked about how black and white really helps you focus on the characters. Like, you're not distracted by a lot of other things in the frame. Like, very often you're really drawn to the people in the frame in, in a black and white film. Okay, how about some questions? Anybody have any questions? We have yes. time for just a couple of questions. They're already starting to bring out food. Oh, but sorry. Um, we will take a couple of questions. Sorry Who's for question? taking so long, but that was interesting. Uh, fascinating. You had a question right there. So, Karen, I was just curious. The characters in the cafe are all so quiet and so kind of inhuman in a way. Is that written into the story originally, or did you come up with that theme just to attract attention to, the, to some direction in the story that you wanted it to go? How did, I don't know the story from Carson McCullough, so. You know, I don't, I mean, I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. Well, honestly. it's just that nobody's talking, it's all. Uh, well, the soldiers talk to each other about the map. The soldiers are obviously lost and they have a map, and they're drinking a beer at 7 o'clock in the morning or whatever, and they're, they have their own little story, which wasn't so much... I mean, Carson didn't, in the story, write much about the characters at the bar. She has two soldiers and three mill workers sitting there. They don't... There is no dialogue written for them at all. Um, the mill workers are waiting for the mill whistle to blow, and they're having breakfast. And um, I loved the fact that this is just the routine of their life. They're, it's early, they're tired, they're having breakfast, they're reading the paper, they're smoking cigarettes. They don't have much to say to each other. Um, the soldiers do have a conversation on and off about you know, being, you know, trying to figure out where they're going. But I, I, you know, I don't actually think of them as inhuman at all behind the, this conversation. Although, you know, it was one of the great challenges of us in terms of for us in terms of the sound mix and sound editing is how much of the world's crossing over, 
And it was not only uh, a challenge for us, but it was a challenge for the mixer and for the editor because it's, it's somehow the less sound you have in the film, the more difficult it is to mix it and to edit it. So, so uh, it was, it was um, I would say, one of the most difficult aspects for us. But um, no, the, the, I, the characters, I think the idea was really to have them very much lost in their own worlds, in a sense. I mean, that everybody really in the cafe, when the boy comes in and sits down, everybody is so preoccupied with themselves that in a sense there is this yearning in the boy to connect that isn't really there with anybody else. Like, yeah, yeah. You had a crazy old man <laughs> who's been alone on a wide, wide sea and discovers what love really is about and grabs a younger person and says, yeah, I've got to explain this to you and everybody else is, you know, ignores it. But it, it felt like, I, I wonder, is there anything there? Um, yeah, I don't know that it's Coleridge. That's a really interesting reading and I hadn't thought of that. But um, the story that Carson tells, and I always say before I describe what Carson tells about her own life, is that you got to keep in mind that she was a fiction writer. She made things up. Uh, and we know that according to what Carlos Du says about when the story was written and published, uh, and what she says in her previously unpublished uh, autobiography, Illumination and Night Glare, that he later edited and published, it, they can't both be true. Uh, but uh, it seems that this was at a period when she had returned home to Columbus from New York. This is after she had become famous. And while her parents still had the house in Columbus and had not yet, her father had not yet died and, and her mother bought the house here in Nyack. And uh, she uh, suffer, suffered from a series of strokes. And she went through a short period there when, it seems like she must have had a mini stroke. And she couldn't even read a book, much less write one, and was in a coma for several days. And it was also at this time, Reflections in a Golden Eye, her second book had come out. And the Ku Klux Klan in Columbus had called her house and said, tonight is your night. Because they said, we don't like nigger lovers and we don't like fairies around here. And so then she went into a coma. And then she came out of that coma and wrote this story. It's an amazing story. A tree rock yes. cloud. It's an amazing story. The story of how she wrote the story is pretty amazing. She was 25. Yeah. It was uh, 1942, if Carlos Duz is correct, and I, and I think he's probably right. She places it at around 1940, but she, I think she can't be right about that. Anyway, um, I think that's an amazing thing. Uh, that that is, uh, that, that that's the, what the story came out of. But something else that strikes me is that Carson wrote all of her major works in a period of like about five years. She had written uh, The Heart is Lonely Hunter, uh, and it was in press, and she wrote Reflections in a Golden Eye, and it was, uh, you know, in the can and ready to go, and already had Member of the Wedding and Ballad of the Sad Cafe underway, and then she wrote this story, you know, just woke up one day out of a coma. And so uh, the thing is, she had some big themes, loneliness and love. And all of those major works focus on those big themes. And so to me, it was like her mind, her creative, you know, being was dealing with that big theme. And that's how that story came about. So. I'd like to thank all of our guests for our fascinating discussion and two wonderful films, and thank you all for coming.